Hello, everyone. I am Frank Data DiLorenzo. Excited to be with you today for our quick launch live. We got a real treat for you today, so we're going to jump right in. A uh, couple of housekeeping items. We really do encourage questions. Uh, you've got the chat comments on the right. Uh, love for you to put a one if you're here with us. If you watch on demand, because this recording will be available, put a two. Good morning out there in LinkedIn land. And uh, this is kept to 15 minutes, but I want to give you a, a heads up. We may go a few more minutes over, maybe 20 at tops, because we have some great content today. So uh, again, put a one in the chat, questions in the chat, two if you watch later. And you know what? If you put a three in the chat, uh, that means you'd like to talk about this subject further. In these LinkedIn Lives, our goal, again, is to provide some education, give you some food for thought, scratch the surface on some uh, really impactful and meaningful topics but if you ever want to have a conversation and deep dive into any of these, that's what we do. That's what we're here for. and We love doing it. So without further ado, it's my sincere pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today. Uh, he hails from Santa Cruz, California, uh, is the president and founder of the Preferred Strategies team in business now for just over 20 years. Has even a bigger passion for data, I think, than I do. And that's not easy. So please welcome Mr. Adam Krieger. Adam, please take it away. Morning, Chase. Perfect. Thank you, Frank. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us this morning. And uh, uh, I can't say enough about I think the importance of just sharing information. I think that's this is really the main goal is just to take what things that we've learned and and share it. And if it helps you on your data journey, then that's wonderful, right? So I I think um, we've got a few things that today. The topic being kind of build versus buy and build versus buy what. And I think we're going to kind of cover that now. So I'm going to show my screen. Maybe Frank, uh, let me know when you. Yep, just hit the share and I'll put it in the banner. Morning, Jill. Morning, Ben. Love seeing you all here. Again, Chase. Morning. All right. So here we go. There you go, Adam. We've seen it. Got it. Yeah. So I think, uh, you know, when it comes to data and when it comes to, you know, uh, reporting and BI, business intelligence and analytics and data visualization, there's lots of options out there and, and we're kind of primarily focused as a company around the Microsoft stack. We do have customers running some of the other technologies, but, but really when we're speaking to this, um, you know, it's, it's, you can't just take a technology and sometimes people think, Oh, I can go down and download power BI for free. I do that. And all of a sudden, voila, I connect it to any data source and it's just magic going to just happen. And, and unfortunately, it just, there's no easy button. It doesn't happen like that. And so we'll walk through that. So I think you'll get a sense of that today. Um, but really, if we focus up here in the leaders quadrant, with something like a Microsoft, Power BI, or Tableau, or Click, a lot of times there's, there's in essence, an, an engine, there's a data set, there's a foundation, a platform, there's work that has to be done to bring the data and translate it and transform it and make it usable so business users can start dragging elements into the canvas and getting results. And I think that's kind of the key is that foundation, that platform, that information engine or bank. Think about it, you know, a variety of different ways. But that's really what we're going to be touching on on the build, building that layer uh, between your data and, you know, the end user, right? And I think, you know, I'm going to, oh, might be a little deep, but over try to simplify this as much as I can. I just want to walk through really, um, there's the data preparation side, and then there's what people can kind of they consume data with a technology like Power BI. So this is what we see as, as the most common starting point for companies just starting on this part of their journey. You have your, you know, variety of different data sources, not just the ERP, but just keeping it simple. ERP has its own set of challenges. So, you know, the ERPs that we support, JD Edwards, Viewpoint, Vista, NetSuite, um, you know, some of them are more kind of complex than others, and some the data is totally cryptic, like JD Edwards, where table names are F0101 and columns are MCMCU, and then you know, viewpoint in NetSuite, you know, it's a little bit more legible, right? Yeah. So you can make sense of it. Um, but really, most companies what they'll do is they'll run a report that's either coming from the ERP itself or maybe a third party, and they export to Excel. And I would say probably 80% of the time. Companies even today, we talk to you, how are you doing it? How are you getting information out of the system? To get to that point is the most common, right? They're doing pivot tables, VLOOKUPs, data extract. I mean, it's really get it to Excel, and then they can make magic happen there. Now, 
we all know the challenge with that. We're not going to talk about that today. But really with Power BI, when you download that, you can consume data from a spreadsheet. So this is where people might take data from the spreadsheet and then you know start building metrics and KPIs and, and content. And then when you publish that you know data that the model that you've created in this instance in the report within Power BI Desktop, and you publish it to the service where people can consume it, it actually populates data sets and reports. So it actually takes one object which you've been building and it creates two. And what happens with that, because of that, people don't realize right away. So next thing they know, they've got, you know, by a handful of different spreadsheets around the general ledger, right? And then they publish those. Now, actually, you know, they've got six GL data sets and, you know, corresponding reports and a handful of AR and AP and sales and inventory. So you get this kind of explosion of data sets. And that's just, I want to plant that seed. But this is really great for prototyping, getting people to see data in a new way. And I think this, by doing, you know, if you have data already in a spreadsheet, throw it into Power BI, make some sense of it. But then once people realize this is amazing and the business really wants to start driving business decisions based on this data, having that foundation being from reports, export to Excel, more manipulation happening maybe in the Power BI desktop to finally get into the user, too many points of failure and too many points of, of concern. So the confidence in that starts to waver and that's when companies say, okay, well, let's automate some of that data so we know we feel more consistent about the data flowing into Power BI. And this would be where we see companies that kind of figure out how to move beyond the prototyping phase into maybe we call it maybe automating or reducing those data sets, right? So we get, okay, now we've got one GL data set and one sales data set, not five and eight. And, and so next thing you know, and this is good. When we see companies at this level, we're fairly impressed because they're already probably you know further down the road than the than the many of the others that we we come across. But really the goal is I think to take it to another level because you've probably heard the term single source of truth, right? And a single source of truth is getting this centralized governed source of data where you can centralize business logic. So when we'll show this in a minute uh, live. Think about you know different KPIs and metrics that are living in your data that you need to analyze, like gross profit or you know you know build or earn revenue or so these are are calculations that should not be repeated multiple times. They need to be placed and created once that everybody in the company knows how it's calculated and everybody knows if I'm pulling from this approved, certified, governed data set, I'm going to get an accurate result. And be able to make a decision based on that result. Adam, that's a huge point. And I did want to interject. I was so darn excited to kick off everyone. I didn't uh, illustrate what the title of this truly is. So that blue cube that Adam's going to dive into further, you see at the bottom, do you build that? And what does that take? And what does that look like? Or do you buy if there's one that happens to be pre-built for the solution that you're deploying? So build versus buy. How do you decide what's the impact your organization? And uh, Adam didn't mean to interrupt you there, but I wanted to make sure I clearly illustrated what we're what we're uh, covering today. So thank you. Perfect. No, thanks, Frank. And uh, looking at the clock, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on a little quicker now. But just want to point out again, there's options, and this is part of when you're going to build and building out your requirements and understanding what makes sense for the business and what lives on premise, what lives now in the cloud, and so you get a lot of considerations that come into this. And so, you know, we can talk all about that, you know, uh, another time, but, but really this blue cube, as Frank mentioned, this is what we're talking about. How do you build this foundational layer to get govern analytics and simplified BI to, to your business, right? And so what we'll show very briefly again um, is once you have this data set and you wanna connect and build Power BI reports, um, you can do that, or we're not going to show it today, but paginated reports. So we're, we do this for P&Ls and balance sheets and or any type of really formatted uh, row based type reports and then Excel. And we'll show a glimpse of that as well. All right. So I'm going to move on and I'm going to start with again, I made the comment that people sometimes misunderstand or don't understand that with Power BI, you can go to down go to power, uh, the web if you don't already have Power BI. 
download Power BI Desktop. You'll get to something like this. Recommend everybody does that if you haven't already. But you'll notice that when I open up Power BI Desktop, there's nothing here in the fields list. So the, the fields panel is really what are the elements I can drag into my canvas to get something, right? Whether or not it's a report or a chart or whatnot. So you can get, get, get data. There's all kinds of data sources. Now, Power BI is agnostic to data. There's new connections opening up every single month, new functionality coming out every single month. But it doesn't know anything about ERP. So if you're running uh, Vista or JD Edwards or NetSuite or SAP, it's not going to, voila, again, that magic won't, won't be there. So I'm going to open up another report, which is um, one of our out-of-box examples here. So, you know, here we've got maybe an already defined report and a user could go in and maybe take one of these. And, and if they want to change this, it's as simple as literally just click on it. And you can kind of see the charts change. You can kind of drill down on things, right? So if I drill down, I can kind of start answering some questions literally by just the click of a mouse. But also, I want to point out, I've connected to a report. This report already had some data elements to it. So this happens to be kind of an example of a viewpoint, a job cost report. So we'll have information and in, in attributes around the job or the contract. We go to job cost details. And now we can, you know, these are those, we talked about these governed metrics, right? Like gross profit, but actual build, cost, hours, markup, profit, right? Unit price and so on. So, so this is where, again, it's as simple as I can find this. If I want to look at maybe actual build, job to date, and I want to see maybe my cost job to date as an example, I can go ahead and just drag that in as well. And maybe I want to see this by job. Okay, so if I go up and look at my you know, job, and we, we also do things like adding the, the value and the description, right? Just sometimes it's a little easier to kind of get those together. Otherwise, you know, it's hard to tell maybe what's what. Now, we said job to date. And so one of the things that's important is what does that mean, right? Or month to date, year to date, is that what's that calculating through? And now if I go and grab, let's say, like a year period and bring that into our canvas. And now I can go ahead as a user and I can turn that to a slicer and pick. Right. I can actually pick a value here and it's going to recalculate that job to date based on that. There's also things we can do if we want to maybe take this and maybe change the format. This is where some people just like to get a little more creative. Right. Maybe I want these to be you know, as little buttons, make it more, more, you kind of usable and interactive that way as well. Now, um, we can also go, if I notice I mouse over this, right, we can drag, maybe I want to get, what's my profit, but I don't want to drag that into the visual. I want to see maybe profit percent as maybe a um, tooltip, right? So when you mouse over it, I can see that profit percent, even though it's not something that's actually in my chart. So you can now see as I mouse over, we've got you know profit percent popping up. Take a time, don't have time to play, but this is really the idea of what are we talking about building to go from that clean slate to getting these objects defined and the relationships. And when it comes to these technologies like Power BI or Click, there's a certain uniqueness on how data needs to be modeled and set up to be relatable. Right, and how to create these these joins amongst the data. So that's, in a nutshell, Power BI. Now, for those that are in finance, maybe out there loving Excel, I can create a pivot table against the same data set, right? So it allows you to go in and you can know the same type of governed calculations that we just were showing. We could drag those into pivot tables. So again, your people that are wanting to get the same information, consume it in Excel, consume it visually in Power BI, Mm -hmm. all coming from that single source of truth. So the key is that single source of truth. Um, Adam, uh, if I could interject really quickly. Um, this is this data model that we're looking at, whether it's viewed via Excel or Power BI, represented by that blue cube on your slide. Uh, the challenge for someone to, to build that internally, what does that look like? What kind of monumental uplift is that? And then we had a nice follow-up question, and I'm just jumping in to respect our time. Uh, quick question, 
if buy is the choice, how long does it take to get up and running? So could you address those two items for us very quickly? Yeah, so one of the last things I was going to end on was a little bit of what if, like how do you go and, and start building if if you don't have the luxury of buying something? And and uh, as far as our quick launch with preferred strategies, mm -hmm. um, we have, it depends on the ERP, but it's going to range anywhere from about four to five weeks up to about 10 weeks, depending on which ERP. But that's not just building anything. It's actually taking an already built solution, configuring it to an organization. So for us, you know, we have these measures like mm -hmm. revenue, right? Well, we, what defines revenue is different for every organization and how they configure that. So we have, you know, go through the 10 week and it also includes for a lot of our customers, the foundation, because they might be brand new to Power BI and not have anything in place. So, you know, we need to work, work together on that. So, so that's the main. Oh, I'm sorry. Again, I jump in, get excited. So that implementation timeline, which is exciting, I think, you know, depending on the ERP, four to six weeks, up to 10 weeks, uh, that is if a company chooses the path of purchase or, or the buy. That would be correct. Yeah. So that would be kind of the buy route. Um, and then the assumption with any buy route, and sometimes we hear people say, oh, well, we're so customized that we can't buy anything. We have to build everything. And, and I think if we look for what we've done is we've tackled it as having a foundation and a starting point. So we call it quick launch. It's not intended to be everything that's going to be your data set three years from now. That's where we, in that time frame, we get it up and running, work together. So you can take that instead of spending two or three years, you get that in, in a matter of weeks. And then you can start expanding, bring in all of your other data sources, bring in more measures. Um, and and you know you have custom tables within you know your ERP add those to the mix. So if someone's taking the build route. These are some of the components they have to consider in in successfully navigating that process. That's right. So okay. we want to kind of share for everybody because you know quick launch and preferred strategies may not be an option for every every company based on your different data sources or ERPs that you might be mm -hmm. be going against today. Now we always love to hear feedback from. From companies that are, are running a system that think that you know something like quick launch may be of value so we're always interested to hearing getting and getting your feedback um this is something we'll walk through it's a kind of a bi cost calculator for building those layers and um if you're interested in, in doing some what if and playing with with a, this a tool like this um let us know and we can kind of send you a link um so you can kind of do your own what if but Really, we look at the breakdown of the build steps. So it's like any project, and a lot of you might be running projects as part of your business, but you know it's gathering requirements. And so, you know, how many weeks per module for gathering requirements or architectural design, developing, constructing a solution, then constructing the metadata with all the measures and the things we just talked about in metrics, testing and QA, uh, solution rollout and training. So we kind of by default put in you know what we think is probably a, a the right number of weeks but you can come in here and say well we're much better than that so we're going to only take us a week to gather requirements architectural design is three weeks maybe our developing a solution is four weeks constructing metadata we actually think that might be three and then everything else is fine so that's kind of you know gives you the idea of how many weeks for these different steps and then based on that and then what you fill in for the resources down here like how many project managers do you need? Data architects. What is the salary that makes sense for for that? And these are kind of just I think by looking at some of the default salary guides out there for these these typical roles. So um, you can kind of choose your different number of those. In this case, you know maybe we'd recommend having you know one of each, and then it can kind of build out what this this is. Now this is maybe for one module. And all these modules in this sake of this model or you know this kind of calculator are all equivalent but normally you might have certain modules that are very simple yes. with very little going on and others that are extremely complex so in this case it's really just counting the modules but if we are let's say a jd edwards customer as an example running general ledger and accounts payable and accounts receivable and sales you can kind of see that it just starts to to kind of look at sure. okay how many total weeks right so this might be 105 weeks based on that and you say well you know i more that i think about this maybe this is really you know only three weeks instead of four weeks right and so you can kind of 
see it just kind of change in front of your eyes. Yeah. This comes up back with the total amount, total weeks, average cost per week, average cost per module, and then the, the average weeks per module. So like I said, this is a, a, an example. We do have some assumptions um, where we, how much of those different roles are, are trickling into those different development steps. And those will, will make that interactive as well. But so anyways, I, I know I'm looking at the time. I'm, I'm just about out. But if you are interested in this, and like I said, it's just play some what if. You can kind of come up. But this, I just want to leave it on. Um, we have a, a, a great customer, you know, uh, international group, you know, IGI Wax. Yes. They manufacture wax. And and uh, before they, they decided to partner with us, went through this process looking at options hmm. and found that the alternative was going to be two and a half years and 900 plus thousand dollars in in wow. the development and build route and the good news with IGI wax is now they're up and earning so quickly they started expanding their analytics strategy so fast that they have found uh you know within the first year or so ways to get you know I think around 10 million dollars additional kind of profitability and so on so it's you know they'd be turned into in essence uh IT into a profit center so, you know, they've got a great story there. And, uh, you know, so I just wanted to share if something like this is a value, just uh, send you the link. So, Adam, this is great. There's a lot to unpack here. First of all, this is awesome. We did get a question from the audience and build is how many weeks and buy is how many weeks. And I'm going to say, I think build, you have to talk more in terms of months, really, or even year, year plus, where buy is truly uh, weeks. But as I said, uh, this is really a great tool, a lot to digest. And in the spirit of our Quick Launch Live, we want to just kind of give you an intro. Adam is very uh, graciously offered that we will share this, which I think is incredible. And we're more than happy to engage with you and discuss it, walk through it. What does that mean? You may have questions on really what do you mean by uh, a data architect? What does that entail? Well, that's a deeper dive into the content than this platform's meant to cover is our Quick Launch Live's really meant to introduce you. So the fact that we will share this, we're more than happy to walk through it with you alongside you step-by-step step, so you really get some value from it. Uh, and consider this BI cost calculator. This is really your build calculator if you're gonna go down that path of building a model versus purchasing a model that's already been vetted out and is specific to your ERP. Let's recap that the ERPs that we happen to have a model pre-built for, JD Edwards, NetSuite, Viewpoint Vista and Salesforce. So if you happen to deploy any of those systems, we may be able to have you uh, up and running and quick launch live type of time frame, which is be exciting. So Adam, I'm gonna go ahead and, and wrap this up. We're a few minutes over, as I said in the beginning, but I think it was for uh, a great reason. Reach back out. If I see a three in this uh, chat at any point, I'll reach back out. And if you'd like the link to the calculator and discuss it, happy to do it or talk about what build versus buy in general means to your organization. So Adam, I can't thank you enough for taking time out of your busy schedule to do this and build a great calculator. You always always impressed me with that that speed of uh, building these, these, these tools out. So that was great. Uh, again, recap folks, build versus buy. What does it mean to your organization? And uh, we'll get content out for our next week's LinkedIn Live and look forward to seeing you there. I'm Frank Data DiLorenzo. Thank you for your time today. Have a great day. We appreciate it. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Frank. Thank you, Adam.